Okay, so John. I'm a John guy. You're not supposed to have favorites, but John's my favorite. Like John's his, his epistles, Revelation, obviously, his gospel. Uh, so like we do when we start any book of the Bible, we're going to talk about who the author is. Uh, are there arguments and theories on which John it is? Yeah, I'm not going to get into all those. It's John the Apostle. Okay, it's John the disciple whom Jesus loved, whom he will not call himself by name in his gospel. He'll just refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, so he's the disciple whom Jesus loved, who leaned on Christ's breast at the Last Supper. Uh, the one who was standing at the foot of the cross while the others ran on Good Friday. Uh, the one who testifies of these things, and we know his testimony is true. So we have internal evidence because the author never names himself. You know, he never says, you know, my name is John. Uh, but we do know internally, we know it was the one who sat next to Jesus at the Last Supper. We know it's the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, so we can deduce that it must be one of the inner three, right? Peter, James, and John. Uh, we know it's not Peter because Peter refers to this disciple in chapter 21. And we also know that James died very early, right? So James, the brother of, of half brother of Jesus, he died. He's the like second martyr, basically in the Bible. Uh, so he died very early. So it couldn't be him. So it only leaves John. Uh, and then the testimonies of the early church fathers also attest to John being the author. Uh, Eusebius, uh, who lived around uh, 263 to 339 attested to him being the author. Origen, around, uh, he lived around 210, 250. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, lived around 190 to 200. Tertullian, lived around 190 to 200. Irenaeus, who was a pupil of Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John. Okay, so this is the disciple of the disciple of John, who lived around 180. Uh, and he also attested that John wrote his gospel that John told him. You know, Irena Polycarp, try this again, Irenaeus related that Polycarp told him, John told him he wrote his gospel. You know, so you have that first generation eyewitness that he wrote it. Uh, and also a fellow named Theophilus, not the guy Luke wrote Acts to. Okay, different Theophilus. Uh, and also early church fathers uh, quote the gospel in defense of their faith and teaching. Uh, Tatian, Heracleon, Justin Martyr, and Ignatius, and they all claim John as the author. Okay, so when is the date? Uh, John had to have been written early uh, rather than late. And when we usually say late, uh, talking about gospels, we're meaning the end of the first century. So keep in mind, Jesus' crucifixion around 30 to 38 A.D., depending on when you decide Jesus was born and when you decide A.D. starts. Uh, so call it 30. You're on the year 30. So early dating, that's in the 50s and the 60s of the first century. That would be the early dating. You know, people were still alive that saw these things that were being talked about. They could go, yeah, I, I was there. I saw it. Uh, late, and then you're talking around the end of the first century. Most liberal Bible scholars are going to tell you that, like John and the rest of the Gospels were written sometime in the early second century, that they weren't written down before them. That's nonsense. Uh, it's just nonsense, and I'm not going to get into the reasons why. That's a whole course unto itself. Um, suffice it to say, conservative Bible scholars, such as myself, uh, tend to lean toward the early dating for Gospels, and John is no different. For example, uh, John was probably written in the early 50s, so the early 50s of the first century. Again, within a generation of the Ascension. Uh, why do I say that? 
Uh, John 5.2 refers to a pool in Jerusalem in the present tense, which was destroyed in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. Okay? So, he's referring to it in the present tense. Uh, now, could you say it's the historical present? Uh, maybe. You know, if you want to put a late date on it, you can put it around AD 90. Don't put a late date on it, it's early, because John's Gospel came first. Actually, the first thing that probably came was his letters. So the epistles of John probably came first, then his Gospel, uh, and then his revelation when he was old man. You know, he's in like his 90s by then, or his old, not his 90s, but he's an old man by then, when he's uh, on the island of Paphos. Uh, Another reason for the early, also by me saying you should accept an early date for the dating of John means you also have to accept an early date for Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why? Because John was written after the other ones. Okay, so if I say John was written early, that means by default all the other ones were written early too. Uh, and arguments can be made for that. Like I said, Bible scholars, they can argue both ways. Uh, people, you can read them and go, oh, the, the guy's evidence seems legit. This seems like a reasonable argument. And then you read somebody else for a different kind of date and go, well, this guy's evidence seems pretty good and it seems like a reasonable argument. Okay, that's just what Bible scholars do. This is the stuff they argue about. Uh, is it going to change your faith, whether or not John was written in 90 or 50? No. Uh, does it make some things in the Bible make more sense with an early date? Yes. Uh, it's not quite unto how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, but it's not necessary to know this stuff. But it's good to know. And again, most conservative dating is uh, early. The reason we lean toward early so aggressively, I mean, not at the sake of accuracy, but so aggressively, like, no, you, we really should accept the early dating, is because the later and later and later these dates get, the more and more and more the liberal scholars are going to go see this is when stuff got tampered with. This is, when, this is when they made changes. This is when they made additions. This is when they did all this stuff that why the Bible can't be trusted uh, and why you can't take it literally. Uh, nonsense. Okay, that said, what's the purpose of the Gospel of John? After all, as I just said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are circulating. Okay? They're being read in church. They weren't bound into a book called the Gospels yet, but that's coming. But they wrote all these stories down, and they're called the Synoptic Gospels because they are in synchrony. They tell the same stories from different perspectives, but they tell the same narrative. John is different. Okay? So why did John write it? Well, even at this early stage of the church, there are heretical teachings popping up. And one of the first ones to pop up was called Gnosticism, probably at the time of John's writing was proto-Gnosticism. It wasn't really Gnosticism yet, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn into it. So what's Gnosticism? Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means you know, to know or knowledge. Uh, so the idea of Gnosticism was that there are these hidden secrets, hidden knowledge, right? And if you, if you gain this hidden knowledge, if you study with the right people and you hear the right secrets, then you will have these, these hidden secrets revealed to you uh, that must be understood in order to be saved. Which goes right in the face of everything the gospel writers wrote about you're saved by grace through faith, and this is not of yourself, but it is a gift of God. So early on, this Gnosticism nonsense started. So why did John write? Well, he refutes that very notion right in John 20, verse 31, that these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That is the theme of John's gospel. It goes throughout it. Okay, And John continues in this theme of rejection and reception throughout the gospel. Uh, the reason for that is to refute this teaching. Um, the other gospel writers, the other evangelists, talk about the divinity of Jesus, but not quite so openly as John does. John wrote his gospel, because another thing that the Gnostics believe is like, Jesus was just a man, and he knew things. And that is why he could do the things he did, 
was because he was a man, but he was a special kind of next level man. He knew the secrets. He was in tune with God. So he was just a very special man, but he was not God. So as soon as that heresy begins, is starting up, John writes his, and his is, I'm not going to use the word mystical, but that is the correct word, mystical in the sense that the mystery of the two natures in Christ, the divine dwelling fully within the human. Uh, John deals with the divinity of Christ more so than his humanity. The other gospel writers do deal with the humanity of Christ very well. You know, remind us that he is, yes, a man. He's also God. John reminds you he is God, who is also, by the way, a man. All right, so the emphasis on God, Jesus' divinity, which begins from the very first verse of the very first chapter. That's why he wrote it. Okay, where was it written? It was probably written in Alexandria, somewhere in Palestine, or in Ephesus. Uh, the evidence leans toward Ephesus. So like the letter to the Ephesians Paul wrote, that would be Ephesus. That is probably where John was when he wrote it. Uh, just a tidbit. I mean, we don't know that for sure. Where is Ephesus now? Ephesus is, do I have a map? Does anybody have a map? Yeah. So, Ephesus is a coastal city. It's right here. Yeah, it looks like, if you, do you know where Athens is? Okay, so here's, here's the middle, here's the Aegean Sea. Okay, so here's Greece, and then here is like modern day Turkey, Turkey, okay. Turkey, Greece. Here's Crete. So if you so if you go right here, there's Athens and Greece. Go due east, and you'll run into Ephesus, uh, and you'll run into some other towns that we've already talked about, like Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Philadelphia. The seven churches of Asia Minor, the Revelation, same area, so Turkey, modern day Turkey. Uh, and also uh, Colossae, Colossae, where the Colossians are. And then you go west, again across the Aegean to Athens, you go west a little further, and you will find Corinth. Okay, so right in what we would call the uh, the ancient Near East is what that area was called. Or Asia Minor, it was also called. Okay, so again, John, written early rather than late. The epistles probably came first. Uh, in fact, the epistles were probably the first part of the New Testament to be written. Uh, including Paul's letters were probably the very first. And again, Revelation written in his old age. Okay, so we're going to talk about the prologue. That's probably where we should start. Let's just go ahead and start the book. So I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible because I like the translation better for John than other English translations, but any will do. We'll talk about little differences. Just you're reading ESV, you're reading ESV, what are you reading? Uh, King James. King James, good. That work. All right, so we'll begin with John 1, and we're just going to read the prologue up to when he talks to John the Baptist. So John 1, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his, 
those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. That's where we'll stop. So that verse is that beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John 1, verses 1 through 5, that's called the prologue. Uh, It's really fun in Greek because that is one sentence, those five verses. That is one beautifully constructed, perfect, perfectly phrased, perfectly constructed Greek sentence that expresses all that. And we turn it into five verses in about how many sentences? One, two, three, four. Yeah, actually five sentences. So that's one one big sentence in Greek. One long, beautiful sentence. Uh, I'm just going to read you something I wrote before. uh, Because I can't say it as good as I said it then, so why mess it up? All right, so this prologue, these first five verses. Prologue of John's Gospel, and to a lesser degree, but to no lesser importance, the entirety of John's Gospel makes significant use of the words, word glory, and name to describe the Son of God, right? the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. Those terms are used by John to not only proclaim in a revelatory manner Jesus of Nazareth as the incarnate Son of God, but it also informs our understanding of the incarnation itself, which is what's very, very important about these first few verses. Um, also, the pre-existence of the Son over creation, because we don't always think about that. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews says, long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power, After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Uh, And we're going to see that John's gospel proclaims Jesus Christ in just such a revelatory manner as that, connecting him through the words word, glory, and name to explain his divine work uh, in creation, through history, to the incarnation, then the atoning sacrifice on the cross, his death, resurrection, and his final ascension to the right hand of the Father. And then returning to him who sent Christ into his creation as our sin bearer. That's another concept we're going to keep in mind. Jesus is the sin bearer. right? So the Father sent him into our flesh. The prologue asserts that the word was present with and present as God at the creation. So the same word functioned as a creator, right? So it's kind of the first question I have in our study guide when we start doing that. But John intentionally begins his gospel this way. How does the Bible start? How does Genesis 1-1 start? In the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. Right. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Usually when we think of God, we think Father. And the earth was out formless and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. The act of speaking, the word, huh? the word of God, the word was spoken, and the word created by speaking, creation came to be. So the Father's there, the Holy Spirit's there, and the Son is there. 
He is the Word. He is the act of creation. He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. That was why John started this this way. It takes us right back to Genesis 1.1. So it's like, well, not only is Jesus not just a man, well, he's God. He was there from the beginning. He was there before the beginning, right? So he's going to get right at the beginning and go, boom, talking about Christ's divinity. Okay? So that word then becomes incarnate, which is Latin. Incarnate means to put on meat, right? Chili con carne is what? Chili with meat, right? Right. So chili con carne, chili with meat. So to become incarnate means to put on flesh. So the word became incarnate, became, took on flesh. The word became flesh. All right, and then he tabernacled among us. The word tabernacle, tabernacle just means to dwell. You know, so the tabernacle is a tent, and that's where God chose to tabernacle as a verb means to dwell. So that's where God chose to tabernacle in our flesh with us. He tabernacled in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He dwelled in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and then he was born in the usual way that men are born. Um, we don't want to anthropomorphize the words name, glory, and word by trying to categorize the actions of the persons of the Trinity. That turns into all kinds of heresy if we do that. Um, people want to like call you know the Father the Creator, and then Jesus the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit the Sanctifier. In fact, the ECLA changed the words to the Creed because you know you can't talk about Father and Son. Holy Ghost, because that's you know, the patriarchy and gender stuff. Uh, so they call him Father, Redeemer, and Creator. But Jesus is also the Creator. He is the creative Word. He is the creative Word that became flesh. So you know, we can't categorize persons of the Trinity, although they all have jobs and they all have identity as persons. But you can't pigeonhole them. That, that doesn't work. And if you think that's breaking your brain already, well, you know, that's the Trinity. Just don't think about it too hard. If you think about it too hard, it breaks your brain because we can't. Okay, so the word, the term word is an exception when used to describe Jesus Christ as John does in this prologue. You know, is he anthropomorphizing the word? Well, when anthropomorphize means to give the characteristics of men to something that's not a man. Well, the word becoming flesh, that's about as anthropomorphic as you can get. But he didn't actually, we're not assigning the properties of a man. He actually became a man. So it's okay to do that. So the word, the incarnate word, you can call Jesus the incarnate word, the word becoming flesh. And so the way John uses that word, word, informs the preexistence of the Son. So the Son dwelling among us, illuminates his tabernacling, not only in the incarnation, but the physical manifestation of God in the Old Testament, which we'll talk about more, but where we see the ma I guess his manifestation, when we see the manifestation of God in the Old Testament as something physical, like the cloud of glory, like the pillar of fire, like uh, uh, like the angel who wrestled with Jacob, right? Okay, like the angel of death in Egypt who killed the firstborn who didn't have the blood, right? So we see the manifestation of God in physical form in the Old Testament. Well, that is the second person of the Trinity before he came, became flesh and dwelt among us. So that is not Jesus, because it's not Jesus till he becomes a man, but it is the Son. So you see the manifestation of the Son whenever. God interacts with men in a physical manner. That is what the Son does. He is the manifestation of God in our physical realm. Uh, because God is spirit, right? So when it's time for God to become manifested in this world, because we're physical beings, that's the job of the Son. That is what he does. And we see him throughout the Old Testament doing this. Uh, so again, he's not Jesus. Jesus doesn't, isn't Jesus until he becomes a man when he's born from Mary. But it is the Son. So when you see, we call that a theophany. 
that is an appearance of God in the Old Testament <coughs> in our physical, in a physical way we can recognize. You look like a big question. Well, I'm just saying, so Jesus is the cloud in the in the, the sun. And the sun okay. is yes, the sun. Okay. And, well, because like, that's God, right? Okay. Well, you know, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, and then when the tabernacle stopped, <clears throat> the pillar of cloud would come down on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant and rest there. Okay. And then God, that is where God's presence came to dwell with His people. When God's presence is physical. Yes. We say that it is the second person of the Trinity. That's okay. that's the Son. Um, yeah. So read your Old Testament that way, and you realize that the Son is all over. Because people want to say the Trinity is nowhere in the Bible. Yeah, the Trinity is all over the Bible. Holy Spirit. They talk about the Holy Spirit all the time mm-hmm. in the Old Testament. You know, they talk about the, the Spirit. And they of course talk about the Father. We get that one instinctively. But then all these manifestations of God in physical form, well, that's the sun. Usually when something amazing was about to happen. All right? Okay. It's kind of mind-blowing. It is. It is. I mean, people have written books about Old Testament theophany. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's quite remarkable. Okay, so no one... However, has seen the full revelation of God, which is what John is telling us, until the word became flesh and revealed the truth, which is himself, he is the truth, to the world. Okay, so this revelatory language that is going to keep going, like 14 to 18, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. All this same revelatory language that John is using is going to resonate across time and space when you think about it. You know, and I'm really glad to hear on some of the radio programs of by other Lutherans, pastors that I'm listening to, because I always thought I was the only one that talks about God being outside of time and space when we all know it, but we don't say it. It's like, hey, God's outside of time and space. This resonates throughout time and space because it sounds like something from Doctor Who or a science fiction show. But the Bible tells us these things. And, and they're starting to pick up that language, and I think that's good for people to hear. Because this, this language in verses 14 to 18 resonates across time and space. The sun is uncreated. He was always here. He was here before time and space came into being. He's the reason time and space came into being. He's the one that spoke it into existence, right? First created light and then separated light from darkness, and then created the dry ground and the water, and then finally we popped up things for signs and seasons, the sun, moon, and stars. That creates time, because the next thing is going to make people need something to keep track of time, uh, because it's how we do stuff. All right, so all this uh, ripples backwards and forwards to the before the creation to the last day. All right? Um, Because the truth ripples through the creation to the last day. Uh, That is the gift of truth. That is the gift of Christ. So the word begotten from eternity, what does that mean? Okay, we know begotten usually means, when you beget somebody, it means you had a baby. But Christ is begotten from the Father, from eternity, what does that mean? I don't know. Hmm. He is eternally begotten. He is the Son of the Father from eternity. What does that mean? I don't know. I am a creature of time and space. I can't comprehend what that means because he was begotten of the Father from before time and space existed. So stop thinking about it, <laughs> honestly. Just know the Son is eternally begotten from the Father. I don't understand what that means. Nobody does. And anybody that tells you they do is lying or deluded because they don't know what it means either. We can't comprehend that. There was never a time when the sun was not. He is uncreated. Okay? So once you wrap your head around that, the idea of getting, it starts getting confusing. So don't think about it too hard. Uh, anything dealing with eternity and anything dealing with the nature of God himself 
is beyond our comprehension. Why? Because we're creatures of time and space and anything beyond that is incomprehensible to us. We don't have the tools to think about it. So again, it's not revealed to us. What little bit is revealed to us is mysterious, and that's okay. And the mysteries of the Trinity is one such thing. Uh, it's not a cop-out. It's just not revealed to us, and it's incomprehensible to us. Will it be one day? I think so. That's what I was going to say. Maybe. Okay, so the word begotten of the Father from eternally is revealed, we would say corporeally, in other words, in the flesh, in finite time, and in the case of his ministry on earth, in finite space. Okay, so Jesus, the Son, has a flesh and blood body, in other words, he takes up space and he takes up time. He flows through time, like we do. All right, so to all appearances at first, outward appearances, he is a man because he is fully man. All right, but John's going to concentrate, concentrate also on fully God. And it's going to become important uh, when we start dealing with the sacraments, when we start dealing with the Lord's Supper, understanding the Lord's Supper, which interestingly enough, and I'll just say this here, John's gospel is the most sacramental of all the gospels. There is Lord's Supper and baptism imagery throughout this entire gospel. Ironically, it does not cover the institution of the Lord's Supper. There is no institution of the Lord's Supper in John's gospel. You want to hear about that? Read the other gospels. Uh, there is no baptism of Jesus. If you want to see that, Go read the other Gospels. John will, the Baptist, will mention it second and Hey, this is the one of whom I said, I saw the Spirit descend on a dove. He's already talking about Jesus' baptism in the past tense. Uh, we'll see that in a minute. Okay, so you don't see Jesus' baptism. You don't see the institution of the Lord's Supper, yet there is this washing of regeneration and uh, Jesus' whole bread of life discourse in John chapter 6 that goes on. Like I did a three sermon series on it last summer, right? Because it's just, I am the bread of life. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. I have quoted it, some of it today. It begins with the feeding of the 5,000 at the beginning of John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is the most sacramental chapter in the Bible, perhaps. Uh, but yet, we don't see the institution of the Lord's Supper in it. Why? Because it's covered other places. John doesn't need to rehash that old territory. It's being read about in church. They can read about the night in which Jesus was betrayed and he instituted the Lord's Supper. They are partaking of the Lord's Supper in church. John doesn't need to, at this point, write this stuff down. It's already been written down. He needs to write stuff that is refuting these people uh, who are saying Jesus isn't divine uh, and to reinforce what the other Gospels do, which reinforces this Jesus' divine nature, his true human nature, the, the merger of the two of those in the person of the God-man, Jesus Christ, and uh, kind of ties almost all things together. John's gospel is really amazing. And there's stuff in it that aren't in the other gospels. You know, John's lived a long time. The other God, like I said, the other gospels were read. You know, John was a young man when he was called. He might have even been a teenager. Okay, so he was very young, which is why, why was he falling asleep at the Last Supper, right? Because he passes bedtime. Literally, that's how young he is. Okay, he's like a teenager. Uh, and now it's his time to relate. Now he is moved by the Holy Spirit to write these things down. Okay, so all scripture, all of it orbits the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, all of it from beginning to end. Uh, John's gospel is part of one of the keys we can use to tie it all together. It really brings all this stuff home. Just studying John's gospel by itself does this. Because um, it's neat. John's gospel is really neat. You know, there's all kinds, of, like I said, all kinds of things that are not in the other gospels that are good to see. So, John says, no one has seen God at any time. And that's both in the physical sense and the revelatory sense. So nobody, nobody can look on God and live, right? 
when Moses wanted to see God, God said, well, I'll show you my back because nobody can look at me and look. So here, let me put you here. And when I pass by, you can look up, right? Um, and the same thing with Elijah in the whirlwind. You know, he didn't actually see him. He wasn't in the whirlwind. He wasn't in the earthquake. He was in this still small voice, right? So nobody actually sees him. When you do see him, well, he's the angel of the Lord. He's not in his glory. You can't look on him like that and live. Yeah, when God, when Moses was in the presence of the divine presence on the mountain, he came down and he like glowed in the dark, right? Uh, he had glowed, he had put a veil over his face because he was all shiny. Uh, and every time he did that, you know, because that was as close as he could get and that made him like that. If he was actually right there with him, he would be incinerated. The, the burning bush, for example, another manifestation, that's the sun. That's God manifesting in this physical plane of ours. So the voice of course, the voice, the word, right? Whenever, that's what I didn't say. Excuse me. Not only is it the manifestation of God in the physical plane, but it's usually when he is communicating. So when God speaks, that's the said the word. When God speaks, that was kind of important. I should have led with that. When God speaks in the Old Testament, that speaking, the act of speaking, if it's manifested in a physical form, like a talking bush or an angel, that's the second person of the Trinity. Okay? That is how he revealed himself to us. Uh, the word is always the instrument of revelation. I don't mean the book of revelation. I mean the revealing of God's truth. That's probably enough about that for now. That was great for me. Yeah. <laughs> So, so it's like on the surface, you know, because John's gospel is really easy to read. The language, even in, to read it in Greek, it's more like your first go-to if you're learning Greek, you go to John because it's easy. It's easy to read. Uh, you, you can Even in another language, you can remember, like I can remember the first lines of John in about four different languages, like German, Greek, um, something else I can remember then. Something weird. I learned it in something weird. But you can remember it because it's easy. And they're easy words in every language. They're easy words. So if you're learning a foreign language, one of the best things to do is read your Bible in that language. And the first thing to look at in that Bible is John chapter 1. So if you want to learn a foreign language, get a Bible in that language. Start with John chapter 1 because it's as easy as it gets. Uh, so it's easy to read John, but there's so much going on in John, uh, which is kind of fun. Okay, so... We already answered the first question. I said, compare the first three words of verse 1 with those of Genesis 1-1. All right, so John 1. In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning. Hmm. He must have done that on purpose. Why did he do that? That's what we've been talking about for 20 minutes. So why did John do that? Right? It's to emphasize the fact the sun was there in the beginning. He was there before the beginning. That's important. That's why all this, is the, in the beginning, was the word. Right? Which starts different than all the other Gospels. What do the other Gospels start with, more or less? I mean, yeah, there's some angels talking to young women and dreams and stuff, but what, what's the basic beginning of the Gospel? The Christmas story. Right, the birth of Christ. Right, that's how they start. Well, this is John's Christmas. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. That's the John Christmas story. So it's already telling you it's a little different, right? All right. So the word in Greek is logos, logos, logos. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Uh, logos, the word. That word, that phrase, especially the phrase, you ever, you ever heard the phrase, what's the word? It's kind of archaic now, when it was the Sunday, what's the word, what's the good word, what's the word? Yeah. 70s style, right? That phrase had its roots in Greek philosophy. That actually goes back, so it's not just something cool from the 70s. But it, all, it goes all the way back to Greek philosophy, the actual phrase, what's the word. When a new philosopher went to the Aragapas, 
Arabicus, I can never pronounce it right, to share his thoughts or his ideas concerning the meaning of life or whatever it is philosophers philosophize about with each other. Okay, the other philosophers would come to him and say, what's the word? Uh, what's the logos? What's the word? To the Greek philosophers, the logos was the principle of the universe. All right? It's the truth that explained everything and gave meaning to everything, um, including the meaning of life. So it was the source of the beginning of the universe and what kept the universe in order. So like the Greeks were kind of onto it, right? And it's like, well, yeah, because in the beginning, John says, in the beginning was the word. So is he making a play on that? Or is it coincidental? I don't want to say it's coincidental, but it's like, yeah, here's these pagans that had it like this close. And we can look in some Japanese uh, mythology, too. They had it this close. And there was a Roman emperor uh, named Marcus Aurelius who was this close. There were all these people that got this close to getting it, and they didn't get it. You know, so, but many of these Greeks, later, thousands of years later, when John comes along, many of these Greeks become Christians. Uh, so this idea of the word becoming flesh, that would not be that foreign to them, necessarily. Uh, was this gospel written to to the Greeks specifically? No. Is it written to Jews specifically? Like Matthew's gospel was the gospel to the Jews. Um, Luke's to the Gentiles, to the Greek speakers. Uh, John's is for everyone. You know, John is doing what John does, which we'll see in this gospel. Again, reinforcing the divinity of Christ. But this idea of the word, that the, the word kind of held the universe together, this weird Greek philosophical concept, uh, was a thing. And then it turns out, well, actually, there is a word that holds the universe together, and his name is Jesus Christ. Uh, again, they're on the right track, but they didn't see God. And that actually goes to something else we'll see in this gospel, and one of these things against Gnosticism and against this hidden knowledge nonsense Okay, a lot, a lot of people, even today, because these heresies stick around forever, people say, I can find God in nature. Yes, you can find evidence of God in nature. Yes. But you do not find your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in nature. He's not there. The sign, the hints are there. The hints of a creator, of an architect of the universe, to use the words that our founding fathers would have used as Masons, this idea, which is very Gnostic, by the way. Um, this idea of I could look at the creation and see the hand of a creator. Great, but that does not save you. What God is it that you're seeing? Is it the Holy Trinity who sent his only begotten son to die for you? You don't see that from nature. It's not enough. It's good, good. You see God. So did the Greeks. They saw the hand of God in everything. What God? Many gods. They even had a temple to a God with no name, which Paul actually addresses in the book of Acts. Was the book of Acts? Yeah. Uh, so this idea that something is keeping the universe in order, good, not enough. And John is going to show us what's enough, what's sufficient. Okay, so John identifies... Jesus as the Logos, as the Word. Okay, so, in him was life. What did John mean by that? Jesus is life. In him, the Word is life. Without him, there is no life. Mm -hmm. Go a little further. Let's think about those verses I read from Hebrews, which come up over and over again because they're wonderful. Right? So Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, which says, In many times in various ways, in days of old, God spoke through the prophets, but in these last days he speaks to us through his Son. The Word, there's a speaking again. right? So Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the life. So, John is also talking about the word preached, the word proclaimed, the actual Bible now, Scripture. 
that's where life is found. Okay? We don't find it in the clouds, right? These nature worshipers that try to find God on the mountaintop. They don't find God there. They don't find God in sacrifices. Uh, they don't find God by sitting around in the woods beating a drum. They find God here. There's where life is. This is where God communicates to us today. If he's communicating to you where you can hear him, you got to ask, is that actually God talking or is that a demon? Because God doesn't communicate that way anymore. So in him was life. The life, he is the life. He is the light. How can the light be the light be the life of men? How does he do all these things? Because he became flesh. Because he's true God and true man in one being, Jesus Christ. Um, and we will talk more. These are hard questions. These are more questions not really to answer now, but to think. Always think back to that prologue. What, do, what does this mean? Sure. It's a little off topic. Knock yourself out. This is how he communicates. This is mm -hmm. life. This is everything. Mm -hmm. When possibly, you know, there's someone, a new Christian, just coming to, to accept Jesus and know Jesus. What is a good way to communicate with them that you, and I know we've covered this before, but sitting at home and re reading a Bible, hey, that's great, but that you need the community and you need the under-shepherd to mm -hmm. understand it. Like, sitting at home reading this by yourself makes it about you. I, I'm <coughs> not great at communicating that with people. Then you take them to the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. That's, I think, the best place to go. So the question is... <laughs> A new Christian, that's great, they're reading their Bible, but then they begin to think, well, that's all I need. It's me and my Bible and God, and that's all I need to do. It's like, no, there's a communal aspect of this to which we are commanded to join together in community, to bear one another's burdens, to share in the breaking of the bread and the prayers, right? That's what church is, so the Lord's Supper and the divine service. And we're not meant to be solitary. Well, how do we get that? Well, when you look at I think it's... I want to say Acts 10, but I always get this wrong. 8. Nine. Eight. Yeah, so if you go to Acts 8, chapter, or Acts chapter 8, verse 25. Or go 26. Uh, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jeru Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come up to Jerusalem. Yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But he's in his chariot, and he's reading the scroll of the book of Isaiah. Because the Bible hasn't written yet. I mean, the New Testament hasn't written yet. He's reading the prophets, right? And the spirit leads Philip to go to be where this eunuch is. And he's sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, you know, go up and join his chariot. So Philip hitches a ride, hears him reading Isaiah and says, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, no, how can I? How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the passage of scripture which he was reading was, he was led as a sheep to a slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent. It's a prophecy about the Christ, about Jesus. And so the eunuch says, tell me, who is this he's talking about? And Philip says, let me tell you about Jesus. So he explains and he unpacks it all to him. Uh, and then the Ethiopian eunuch is like moved to believe and he's like, well, what do I have to do? He goes, oh, you should get, uh, you need to believe and be baptized. And he goes, well, Here's water. Let's do it now. That's basically the story. So this Ethiopian eunuch has the scriptures open to him. He realizes, oh, I need to be, you know, reborn of water and the word, as we will hear about in John's gospel, uh, born from above. And he will get uh, baptized. So, yeah, you don't under, you can't understand the scriptures unless someone teaches it to you. Um, you can get so far, you can have study Bibles, and even those are not perfect. Uh, but you can get into all kinds of trouble by yourself. If you're the only one interpreting it, uh, that's why, again, community. 
I mean, don't trust me just because I get up there and preach every Sunday that I'm preaching perfectly accurate doctrine. I, I am, by the way. But if I ever don't, you guys need to test the spirits. It's like, oh, I read something in the Bible that seems to contradict that. Pastor, what did you mean? Yeah, don't just go, false teacher, if you're going to accuse me of false teaching, you better have your ammunition loaded. All right, you better come at it with evidence. Uh, but do. If you think I said something that's false teaching, yeah, that is on you to go, hey, I didn't, what did you just say? And it may be a case of maybe I could have said that better or it was confusing or it could lead you down the wrong path. That does happen. I'll even read stuff and go, I could have said this different. You know, I'm not going to bring it up next week. Like, hey, do you guys remember when I said such and such? I shouldn't have said it that way because you're not remembering what I said by then. Right. But if it's like in the, the look, oh, okay, I should, I should make that clearer next time I preach this. Because someone could take that the wrong way. Sometimes you catch that. But if you catch something like that, then it sounds like, that. Like, hey, Pastor Steve, that didn't sound kosher. Call me on it. Let's talk about it. Maybe I could preach it better. Maybe I preached it wrong. And I got to get up in front of everybody and go, hey, I really said this stupid. And we got to fix it. Because I didn't mean it that way. Uh, it is on you guys to make sure I'm teaching correctly. Um, doesn't mean you have to know it all. It just means what we mean whenever we read the Bible, which is let the Bible interpret the Bible. So if like you think, hey, I read something somewhere that sounds like that's the exact opposite of what you said. What's going on? Let's talk about it. Um, 99 times out of 100, I'm, I'm not teaching false doctrine. I'm not just making the stuff up as I go along. Hope not. Anyway. It just uh, confirms what you say about community. Because if it's on us, you know, to yeah. make sure you're preaching the gospel, which you do, and then it's on you to make sure we're understanding it correctly. Yeah, because okay. the first thing you're supposed to go is like, hey, what do you think Pastor meant by this? And somebody will go, oh, yeah, that's blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, okay. And it's like, I don't know. It's like, Ask but doesn't the Bible say this? And they're like, yeah, that doesn't sound right. So then two of you come and go, we don't, did you mean to say it this way? And you fix it. Yeah. So that's a good that's a good thing for us to do. If it's just you and your Bible, you come up with all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, like the rapture, <laughs> or you know, Jesus coming back to Earth before He comes back to Earth, you know, coming back to Earth to reign before He comes back to judge. You know, again, it's all misinterpreting the Bible because if you read it on your own without anybody to tell you, hey, you know, this was written in a different language before you got this. And it doesn't mean what you think it means. Or this kind of writing isn't the kind of writing you think. This isn't a novel. You know, this isn't a narrative. This is goofy writing. This is apocalyptic, like Revelation, right? If you just pick up a book and read that, not knowing how to read it, you're going to get in really big trouble really fast. Um, same thing with, with some of the things in the New Testament. We'll read things like James. People have a lot of trouble with James chapter 2 because it says, you know, are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? Well, if you read what it says carefully, you're saved by faith. But yet for, you know, 1,500 years, the Roman Catholic Church has been saying faith plus, faith plus works, because they interpret it wrong. Which is why a guy named you know, Martin Luther got in on the act in the first place. Uh, so, yes, that, that's where I would go. To, to short answer is, yeah, show them the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. You can't, if you read it all by your lonesome without knowing how to interpret it, I mean, would you know, would we know if we never heard ever from a teacher that, oh yeah, you know, if you read the book of Psalms, those are all prayers and they're every single one of them about Jesus. I'm like, what do you mean they're all about Jesus? They're all about Jesus. Every single one, all 150. They're also our prayers, but they're also Jesus's prayers. Even the yep. These are all you know, tradition, not the Bible. Tradition holds that on the cross, Jesus recited all 150. And the parts we hear are the words from the cross because actually everything he said is from one of the Psalms. Uh, so, you know, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, forgive them. They know not what that. Everything comes from one of the Psalms. Uh, anyway, so if you don't know, oh, the prophets, you know, like Isaiah, what is all that stuff? Well, a, a lot of it is prophecy about the Christ. You know, just like the Ethiopian unit finds out, like, what is this? Well, it's about prophecy about Jesus. 
let me tell you about Jesus. So now you read the Old Testament with that eye, and it's like, oh, it's all of a sudden a lot of this stuff starts making sense. A lot of it is history, but a lot of the prophecy stuff is like, well, it's about Jesus. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. But if you have no one ever tells you that, you're just like, what is this stuff? It's like reading Revelation. What am I reading? What is this stuff? This is crazy. Unless somebody tells you, oh, you know, it's an allegory for, yeah. And then you go, oh, that makes sense, sort of. It's weird. It's still weird, right? The book's still weird, but it makes sense now that we know how to read it. So unless someone teaches you that, and then, well, where did you learn it from? Well, I learned it from my professors, and I learned it from reading the church fathers. Well, where did they learn it from? Well, they learned it from their mentor, who learned it from his mentor, who learned it from an apostle, who learned it from Jesus. So, yeah, it's been handed down. Not that the word of the early church fathers is above scripture. Nothing's above scripture, but those guys are pretty sharp, you know? So, yeah, we have to learn how to read the Bible. We have to be taught how to read it. And if you just go off on your own, I mean, even just going on Amazon and finding something to help you learn on your own is going to get you in trouble. Nine times out of ten, I guarantee it. You're going to find, oh, well, here's a study aid, and it's like going to be some stuff that you probably shouldn't be reading. But anyway... Yes, that's why. Thank you. That's why. We get in trouble if we do it by ourselves. Yes. Okay. Okay, so, so we know how the life can be the light of men because that's Jesus. So what's the darkness? So it says... Right, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. ESV has has not overcome it, I believe. Uh, verse five, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Right, I have did not comprehend it. What's King James got? John one five. What was your question? I was reading John one five. Do you want me to read what this is up yes, here or down here? Yeah, John 1. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it, it not. Right. Okay. So, uh, the other translation for that word, not comprehend, is also overpower. That is not overcome, not overpowered. Uh, words do change in meaning over time. Unfortunately, but the the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness did not overshadow it. The darkness did not overwhelm it. It's like the light is shining in the darkness, and the darkness can't put it out. Is another way of saying it. Be interested to hear what a paraphrase says. If I had like a, a paraphrase, I should leave a paraphrase here. But like a paraphrase Bible to see how they translate it. Um, it's a study notes for 1-5. Anything? Yeah. Darkness. It's a world estranged from God, spiritually ignorant and blind. The scriptures flatly call natural man and spiritual and divine things darkness. That is, in the dark, blind world, which does not know or regard God. Right. Right, so, you know, the darkness didn't comprehend the light. The darkness didn't know what to make of it. It says here, while well, others say it couldn't overpower the light. Right. Yeah, the darkness can't snuff the light out, but it also doesn't know what to do with it. So what the darkness is, anything un, un-Christian? Or is anything it, that's not God. God. How about not that? God. Okay, it's not of God. So anything not God can't comprehend God, which makes sense. Anything that is not God cannot overwhelm God, right? So that word works. You know, all these different words that the translators have used to get this into a thought, into English, of which not any single one of them, if you mush them all together, you're getting the idea of what it means. Because when you translate something from a foreign language, you never get the exact sense of what it means, uh, especially with a word-for-word 
translation, if you want to unpack it and make every sentence like twice as long to get the exact nuance, that's what you get. Well, that's what a paraphrase is trying to do. But then the bias of the translator comes into account and you get all kinds of false teaching. So like with King James, it's a word for word literal translation from Greek to English. So they have to pick a definition and go with it when they translate it into English. Same with the ESV, same with the NASB. Uh, and you can see these are all three fairly conservative word for word literal translations and they all three say it different. What does that tell you? How hard it is to translate things. Yeah, but you take all these ideas, anything outside of God can't overwhelm God, but also can't put it out, uh, but also can't understand it. All three of those thoughts is what is meant. And they're all right. Because if it's outside of God, we can't comprehend it unless someone reveals it to us. Oh, well, that's what the Bible does. Okay. Question. Sure. Okay, darkness. Would it be fair to say that, I mean, in this world right now, I think a lot of people compare darkness to evil. Mm -hmm. But like the devil, that wouldn't fit your description because the devil knows who God is and certainly knows who God is capable of, but he can't overcome him. Right. But yeah, and, and also because we have this idea of the great cosmic battle between good and evil, which again, even going back to our study of Revelation, it colors our interpretation of Revelation because we want to think of this big cosmic battle between God and the devil. Okay, so the light versus the darkness, the light side of the force versus the dark side of the force. It's a Star Wars reference, by the way. Uh, this cosmic yin-yang thing, very Eastern philosophy, by the way, uh, of the light versus the darkness. Uh, but it's more than that. It's not good versus bad, God versus evil. It is God and not God. Okay? So the light... It's God, and darkness is not God. We are not God. Uh, so it's not not just evil. It's not God. That goes further than just good and evil. But we're from God. Yeah, we are from God. He created us, but we are not God. So until so someone still so until somebody reveals God to us, well, we are in darkness. Made right? in God's image, almost like saying, if you're looking at your reflection. Yeah, that's your reflection, but it's not you. Is that way? <laughs> okay, let's talk about being made in the image of God. So what does being made in the image of God mean? Okay, God is two things. Right? God is love, and God is what? Holy. Okay, God is holy, perfect and good, and what do you think of it? And then God is love, because he told us he is. God is love. God is holy. God is love. So to be made in the image of God is to be made holy and made to be love. And when we sinned, we lost the image of God, which means we are no longer holy. And we no longer know what it means to love. We, we talk about love. We've made a whole cottage industry about singing about love and selling things to help you fall in love or get someone to love you back. Because we don't know what love is. With all apologies to Foreigner. I want to, it's Foreigner. I want to know what love is, right? Mm -hmm. So, got to get a pop culture reference in there somehow. So, we don't know what it means to love truly anymore. And we're going to have a whole lesson about all the words of love in the Bible at the end of this study, by the way. But agape, sacrificial love that has no thought of self, strictly for others. That's what God is. God is love and God is holy. He is perfect. We are imperfect. We are unable to comprehend love. We don't know what that means anymore. We will. We begin to see it. We begin to understand it as it's been revealed to us. That bit of light is shining in the darkness, right, to overdo the metaphor. But that's what that is. So it's the not-godness of us is getting shined on by the light a little bit so that we start to reflect that light. We're still darkness. We're still we're still sinners. But you born a sinner, or you yep. learn to be a sinner? No, you're born you a sinner. Morph into a sinner. You are born a sinner. That is really? what, that is what original sin is. All right. 
Okay, so any, any, any human born in the natural way is born into sin. Okay. They are born sinful. We're tainted with it from the beginning. What do you mean the natural exact, way? Born of the natural way, instead not created by God. Like God made Adam, and he made Eve. Okay. What about those two babies? That's still the natural way. That was, that was still a man and a woman, egg and sperm. Okay. Even though they did it in the tomb. Still, still the natural way. Okay. Was, like God actually made Adam and Eve Himself. So if you read, uh, if you read our confessions, they use that language. It's a very, it's a very scholastic Middle Ages kind of language because it was the Middle Ages. Uh, as they talk about the natural man and the natural man's tendency towards sin. That's where they they will use this word called concupiscence. Concupiscence is man's natural inclination to evil, because we're born that way. We are naturally inclined. The minute we come out kicking and screaming, we are our pure nature is selfish and sinful. We're so born that way. Being made in the image of God was just Adam and Eve, and then as soon as they sinned, they lost the we, image of we, God. We all lost it. Yeah, every, okay. we have, we have okay. lost the image of God. Gotcha. Um, some people will try to tell you the image of God is different from that. And it's like, well, that means God looks like us. God is spirit. Remember, God is spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is spirit. God the Father is spirit. God the Son was spirit, became incarnate. The Word became flesh. And now he is a flesh and blood man now, but not bound by time and space because he is 100% God, 100% man. We'll talk about that later. Uh, that's another one of those kind of things that's incomprehensible. But uh, so being made in the image of God, God is spirit. So it must mean something else. And that something else is what do we, what is God revealed to us of his nature? God is love. God is holy. So if we were made in his image, we were made holy. And we were made to love, to love God and to love each other. That's why he created us. If God is love, he needs an object for that love. He created us to love us. And we are we're supposed to love him. Uh, we kind of kind of pooped the bed on that one a little bit. And that is why his son had to become flesh to live like we were supposed to, because he is created in the image of God. He's uncreated, but he is in the image of God. He is God. He is holy, and he is capable of perfect love, sacrificial love sacrificed himself for the life of the world. Okay, so that's a good question. That's a good question. What is that image of God? Okay, so that's why we are darkness. We are not God uh, because we've lost that image, but we will regain it. That deep stuff. Does that make, everything make sense so far? Yeah. We're like 10 verses in. <laughs> Chapter one. I don't care if it takes I think John's going to be awesome. The, this book, like I said, it's really easy to read this book. I, uh, but it's deep. And then, you know, like we're, you know, we're an hour and ten in. We'll talk a little bit more. Go ahead. Yeah, like with today's uh, sermon, you know, God testing, you know. I mean, I know he tests Abraham, you know, with the sacrifice of the son. And, you know, I, I, did, I don't know. Does God test me? Or does the devil, does, does the darkness test me? Okay, so Good. darkness, not God, not good versus evil. Okay. Stop talking about the darkness okay. as, being, okay. as being bad. God, I mean, it is, it's, metaphorically, it's bad. It's just not evil. Okay. Darkness is not God, ignorance of God. Separation from God, which is bad, but it's not evil. Uh, but that separation from God, that's what we are. Um, okay, God tests us. The devil tempts us. They're different. God tempts no one. God doesn't drop a temptation in your lap and go, I wonder if he's going to sin or not. That's where my... He might test you like, okay, I'm going to put this in your path. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to choose to sin? Or are you going to choose to look to me for an answer or a solution? Or are you going to rely on yourself? That's usually what these tests are. Are you going to rely on yourself? Or are you going to rely on me? Uh, just like the tests today with um, Philip. Uh, you know, oddly enough, we just talked read about Philip talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. Isn't that strange? So it's like, because you don't hear about Philip much. That's one of them. That was the other one. Okay, so Philip, he did that to test him. So he says, hey, Philip, 
Where are we going to get bread for all these people? Philip's like, I don't know. <laughs> now, did Philip try to figure out a solution himself, or did Philip go, well, I thought you were going to take care of that, Jesus. Right? Come on, Sunday school answer. What's the answer? The answer is Jesus. So he was testing Philip. Philip, are you going to turn to me and go, I thought you had figured that out. Or are you going to try to figure it out on your own and go, well, yeah, where am I going to get enough food for 10,000 people to eat in like two minutes? Right, and also the Passover was fast approaching, so probably the, the uh, Sabbath day coming up. Don't know if they were allowed to walk that far. Like, what are they allowed to do? Um, it's obvious, it should have been obvious, like, it, Okay, you fail. Yeah, I don't know. We need this much money to do this, Jesus. How can we do this? Like, okay, they have no looking faith, the no trust. Place for the answer. Yeah, he was looking to the darkness, the not God, right, to solve the problem. Um, I need to hear that. It's like it's like Judas versus Peter. That was Wednesday's night sermon. Okay, so yeah. they were both sorry for what they did. Wrong. Okay. Judas was very, very sorry for what he did. He tried to give the money back. He, you know, ran out and wept bitterly also. Peter ran away, but then he eventually runs toward Christ. Okay, eventually finds his way back into the fold. He repents. Judas looked to himself. If I take the money back, that'll make it better. Uh, no, that didn't make it better. Um, all right, I'm going to... I'm, I'm just going to hang myself. That'll, that's the only way I can make this pain go away. I have the solution. I can't get the money back. That'll make it better. I'm going to go hang myself. That'll make it better because I'll be dead. Uh, that was his solution. Because he looked to himself. So usually with these tests, the solution, the answer to the test is, are you going to choose God or are you going to choose yourself? <laughs> are you going to turn to yourself for the answer or are you going to turn to me for the answer? Are you going to turn to yourself for the solution or are you going to turn to me for the solution? Okay. Who hang themselves? Jews. But he already knows the answer, so why test us? Because he already knows what we're going to do. Okay, that's the difference between God's foreknowledge mm -hmm. and God' power of free will. So just because God knows how it's going to turn out doesn't mean you don't have the free will to make the decision. Okay, God knows whether or not you're going to choose Burger King or Wendy's on Wednesday. That doesn't mean you don't have the free will to choose either Burger King or Wendy's. But you, you, still make the, to. you still make the choice. Right. But he knows what your choice is going to be. So then why test this though? Well, the test isn't for God. It's not for God's benefit. It's for your benefit. So we'll learn from. Right. That's, so why So moment. why was this a teaching moment for that Philip? Right, so why was that a teaching moment for Philip okay. with the feeding of 5,000? Because he chose poorly. He started turning immediately to himself. Well, I could go ask Judas how much money we got in the money bag, and, you know, he kind of skims off the top. But even so, that's still not going to be enough because we need this much money to feed all these people. Jesus, what are we going to do? Fail. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then Jesus is like, okay, now watch what happens next. And Philip's going to go, ah. The answer was, turn to Jesus for answers. Mm -hmm. Now, that answer doesn't mean I'm just going to take my hands off the wheel and Jesus is going to take care of it for me. That's not, that's not the answer here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you still have to do things, but the, the, the solution is God provides as it should be provided. You know, and often when he provides, it's more than enough. And sometimes he doesn't provide because that's going to teach you something else, some other life lesson. Where it's whether it's self reliance, whether it's patience, you know, whether it's self control, all the different lessons these tests can have. Now, the devil, on the other hand, tempts. You're going to choose to sin because it's going to be the easy way out. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between the devil and God, right? And God knows what the outcome of the test is going to be, but you still have to grow. Just because He knows how your story ends doesn't mean the story doesn't get to be told doesn't mean the story is not acted out in real time. He's outside of time and space. He sees all the moves. He sees all the possible outcomes of every branch, of every decision everybody makes. But that doesn't mean he has his thumb on the scale 
to change the outcome. Just because he knows the outcome doesn't mean he influences the outcome. You still have free will. You still make the decisions. The only decision you can't make is the decision to believe in him because that is a gift of the Spirit. So we don't, all the things we get to decide with our free will, deciding to believe him is not one of them. He makes you, he gifts you faith. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit does it every time you read the word, hear the word, and so on. That reinforces it. That's the action of the Spirit. So you do not decide to believe in God. God chooses you to be a believer in him. Yes? This is a very stupid question, and I apologize. Is it still worth praying for someone that God will work in their hearts to make them believers? Of course. Why not? Why not? Because sometimes it seems futile. Yeah, sure. And then sometimes you know it's not. Sometimes it does take a stroke of lightning. Yes. But all those things together work toward that. So again, all these things, all those decisions we make, I mean, they all put together in this complex web of interactions between people. Uh, so we do that because that's what life is. It, it is a sequence of decisions that we make and, and actions mm -hmm. that we take. Uh, and just because God knows the outcome of every one of those doesn't mean you are not don't have the free will to make those choices. All right? So it's the difference between God's foreknowledge and free will. Um, just because he knows how it's going to turn out doesn't mean it's going to turn out that way whether you do it or not. You still have to make those choices, right? Um, yeah. So just because just just because God knows how it's all going to turn out doesn't mean you don't have to live your life. Um, otherwise, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yep. Yeah. So that's probably that's probably a good place to stop. So yeah, that's the difference between temptation and testing. Testing. You know, so it's like a like a, someone wisely told me long ago, don't pray for patience. And I learned firsthand because I prayed for patience anyway. Don't pray for patience. You won't like the way God teaches you to be patient. Look at Job. Okay, think of Job, and then go. Maybe I shouldn't pray for patience. Be careful what you pray for. Because <laughs> because, we were because he will he will Job. teach you mm -hmm. how to be patient through trial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't, maybe don't think that's the thing you want to pray for. Maybe you want to revisit that. Uh, yeah. Not always. I mean, but yeah, that's a dangerous thing to pray for. Is you might not like the way you learn how to be patient. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you can see we're going to have quite a journey in this book. Because there's stuff, like I said, there's stuff in John's gospel that is not covered anywhere else. Uh also, it covers a shorter time span than the other Gospels. Uh, the other Gospels take three to four years, depending on how you figure it out, how long Jesus' earthly ministry was, and it covers his entire earthly ministry. John is compressed. It's like a year-ish and a half-ish. Okay? And then you'll see things like he'll spend five chapters on Monday, Thursday. Yet, we don't see the institution of the Lord's Supper. Boy, he spends five chapters in the upper room, between the upper room and walking to Gethsemane. Five chapters. The other Gospels, it's like, mm, that much. It's the words of institution, and then they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then they fell asleep, and this happened. All right, John, five chapters of stuff Jesus said. It's like, oh, you know, while we were in that upper room, Jesus said all this stuff to us. And here it is. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of interesting things. Yeah, so I think you will enjoy it. We're going to be in it a while. I think we're looking at, how many did I divide this one into? 23, 24, 24 units. We did the first one today. So we have 23 weeks. All right, so we're going to be doing that. This is going to carry us through the summer. Just about to... Christmas.
The last time I taught it, I yeah, got it just takes <laughs> Yeah, the last time I taught it, I got it to coincide with like Easter, coincided with like the Easter story. We're not going to do that, and that's probably okay. Uh, because when we study John, we will also, we're really going to understand the Passover. We're going to understand uh, what to do when we find contra- what we think are contradictions in the Bible. Uh, there aren't any contradictions in the Bible, not really, when you work through them. Uh, but again, someone has to teach you how to understand what's going on. That's what you're uh, for, preacher. That's what I'm for, <laughs> uh, because we'll, we'll learn how to do that. Um, <clears throat> And some things are just confusing, but other things aren't. There's legitimate reasons why things are the way they are. Uh, One being, are we looking at it from a Jewish perspective or a Roman perspective, a Greek perspective? So a Jewish perspective or the way the rest of the world thinks perspective. And a lot of times they use different calendars, first of all. So dates that don't line up probably has something to do with that. And even among the Jews, they had four different calendars. Like this group had this calendar, this group had another calendar. I mean, it was crazy. We think it's bad enough when just one state doesn't want to do daylight savings time. We're like, those people are weird. Well, the Jews are like, these people are weird. They have another calendar. Um, we all have the same moon and stars. And <laughs> how do you? Yeah, you think it wouldn't get that hard, but yeah. Yeah, so that is where we'll end. We'll pick up with the rest of chapter one next week.